Hello, I'm Aquila Kent. Um, and behind me is just my craft corner. Never mind that. This is just the best place in the apartment for lighting right now. So I am going to go over uh, my salpingectomy. Um, sorry to go over why I got it done, how I got to this point, and also to tell you guys how it went and what the recovery's been like. Um, right now it is Friday, uh, July 12th, and I had the surgery on Monday the 8th. So I'm already pretty well recovered from it. Like I just went back to work for the first time today, just for a half day, and I managed it fine. Like my energy level was great. I'm able to move around and get to my desk and the printer and everything just fine. Um, I had to be a little bit careful with like bending and leaning down and stuff, but I can still do it. I just have to take it slowly and be careful. So how I got to this point. So for, I have a very long history of dealing with my gynecologists and I've had quite a few between Utah and here in Oregon. And thankfully I'm not in Utah because I feel like the doctors might be more open to these kinds of procedures here in Oregon than they would be in Utah. Um, not necessarily related to the salpingectomy itself, but like TMI, I guess, my periods have never been regular. I've always bled um, far more often than I should. I think the longest I've bled was about three months straight. And then the only thing that came close to being normal was pretty much a reverse normal menstruation cycle where I would bleed for like two to three weeks straight, have maybe a few days to a week off, and then bleed for two to three weeks again. So I have, ever since I was like 14, 15, been very adamant about asking every time I went in, just take it all out. I have no need for it. Just take it out. I'm done with this. Just get rid of it. Of course, they never did. Um, like for one, I don't want children of my own. So that has never been an issue for me. I never dreamed of being a mother. Um, the I would like to adopt eventually in a few years, once my boyfriend and I have like, settled down and gotten married and are living in the same place for a while and have sort of figured out how to live with each other, um, we do want to adopt. And with this procedure, which I think is one of the reasons why they went through with it, um, like there's really no excuse they can give you to not do it. Um, the excuses I've gotten before when I've asked to get a hysterectomy or to get my ovaries taken out or all of it taken out, whatever, it'll take 10 years off of my lifespan. I did not care and asked them to do it anyway. They would not. And the other one was I would change my mind eventually about having kids because my gynecologist changed her mind when she was 30. But I'm not her. Like, I'm 29 now, almost 30. Still don't want children of my own. So I'm good with that. I do not, the very thought of pregnancy and childbirth terrifies me. I cannot go through that process. Kudos and all the congratulations for those who can. Like, you guys are super parents. Go for it. Do what you got to do. It's just not for me. So that's why I chose to have this procedure. And because my boyfriend and I have been talking about engagement and marriage for a while now, um, the initial plan, if you've looked in I think I might have mentioned this in some of the descriptions of my other videos throughout the last year or so. Um, we were going to get engaged sometime this summer and then hopefully married sometime next spring. Unfortunately, my boyfriend has had to move across country to the other coast to be with his family. And we aren't sure if it's just going to be for a few months or if it's going to be for a few years. And so our marriage plans and future plans together have been put on hold for a while. Not sure for how long, but we'll roll with it, figure it out. We'll do what we got to do. It'll happen eventually, just not as soon as we hoped. Um, but at the time that I scheduled this procedure, that was still the plan. And I had been very adamant with my doctor about either as soon as I turn 30 or as soon as I'm getting engaged, this is happening. Because thankfully, my boyfriend is waiting until marriage and I could wait for forever because I honestly do not care about sexual intercourse whatsoever. Um, but at least now, but at least I know that I wouldn't have to worry about it until once I was married. 
So either way, it was getting done before then because I do not want to get pregnant. Like, I don't know what I would do if I got pregnant, whether I would proceed with the pregnancy or terminate the pregnancy once I found out that I was pregnant. Um, I don't know. There's no way to know what exactly I would choose until I was in that situation. And I really don't want to be in that situation in the first place. So this is my way of preventing having to make that choice. I am pro-choice, absolutely. And uh, like with what I'm thinking now, I would go through with an abortion if I found out I was pregnant, just because pregnancy and childbirth terrifies the hell out of me. Um, but I don't know. I might change my mind if I got pregnant. Who knows? I wouldn't know unless I was in that situation, but I don't want to have to make that choice. So this is what I chose. Um, that got a little off. That went on a tangent a little bit. But like back to the excuses. The So there was the, you'll regret it before you turn 30. Well, to heck with all of you doctors who told me that because now I've gotten it done a month before I turn 30. I don't regret a thing. I'm so happy I got this done. So every doctor has given me that excuse, but they never said why. And I don't, I don't see why, how 30 is a magic number of regret. Like I'm almost 30. Like all of my peers have made that decision already. I'm plenty old enough to make that decision. I've wanted this ever since I was a teenager. It has not changed. If anything, the time has only cemented my opinion of getting this done. Don't want kids. We'll hopefully be married in the next couple of years. And I don't want to even have to make the choice about whether I would keep a pregnancy or not. So I, I already have the next one on um, to stop the bleeding. And apparently that's also a really good contraceptive as well to stop pregnancy. But there's always a risk, like always a risk with any birth control. So I wanted to do a double way. And I wanted to do both the arm implant and to get my tubes tied. That was the initial plan of just getting my tubes tied, even though there's still risk with that of ectopic pregnancy. And I think there's also a risk of the tubes like growing back together occurring. But about six months ago, uh, with one of my previous gynecologists, she let it slip that her clinic was having a new procedure they were doing where they could remove the fallopian tubes completely instead of just the tubal ligation. Or they were offering a salpingectomy. And as soon as I found out that wasn't even an option, I had had no idea before then that they could remove the tubes, that they were allowing that people to do that. So I said, yes, that's exactly what I want. Yeah, I think she ended up regretting telling me about that procedure because she started trying to talk me out of it. And I was very adamant about what I wanted as soon as I knew that that was an option. Um, so she said, she told me to think about it a little bit more. And that's when I told her either the moment I turn 30, I'm getting this scheduled or the moment I get engaged, I'm getting this scheduled. And then I ended up having a bankruptcy and one of her charges was wrapped into that bankruptcy and she refused to see me again. So I had to get a different gynecologist after that. And I had my first consultation with this new gynecologist in May. And that's when I ran it by her saying, I want to get a salpingectomy done. I just found out that this was an option. I'm almost 30. I want to get this done as soon as possible. And she did give me the, um, you'll regret it before you turn 30 spiel. But she made sure to tell me that the only reason she was saying that is because she legally had to. But right after that, she asked me if this was what I wanted, like if it was, if I was confident that this is what I wanted. I said, yes, it was. And she accepted that. And within two weeks, I had a surgery date scheduled for two months later. It's July now, a month before I turned 30. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got it done. And now that that part is over, I'm sorry that took so long. Um, but I took a lot of notes about the procedure and what happened before and during. 
and at, well, not during, because that was out like a light, but after the procedure. So a few tips for before the procedure that I would suggest, clean your house or apartment. Um, it's much easier to relax knowing without the weight of knowing that you have chores to do weighing on your mind. So I spent a good couple of days before I picked up my mom from the airport, just cleaning the apartment as much as I possibly could. And it did help. Like I felt like I could actually relax after the surgery because I didn't think like, oh shoot, I have to like sweep them out the floors or the laundry hasn't been done in days and just stressing myself out. But it still helped a lot with the recovery to have everything clean and not have to worry about it. So clean your apartment. It's for your own good or your house, whatever. Clean your place. It's for your own good. Um, the other one is get your prescriptions beforehand. Um, I had a pre-op appointment two weeks before the surgery where my doctor went over everything. I signed all the waivers and all the forms, and I also got my prescription scripts. So I was able to get my prescriptions before surgery, so I had them on hand already. And if you have that option, do it. Like that's one less thing you'll have to worry about once you've been under anesthesia and been cut into and everything. Um, so yeah, get your prescriptions. And then also get your groceries and any other supplies you may need, like bandages, um, I had been warned about the shoulder pain, I'll get into that in a little bit, so I also got some icy hot patches and a heating pad, so get everything you need beforehand so you have it ready. And then also have someone there to help you, at least for the first couple of days. Like, I don't know what I would have done without my mom there for a few days. Like, she arrived the Saturday beforehand, and she I brought her back to the airport a couple days ago, Wednesday morning. So for those first or two days after surgery, it was really helpful to have her here. Like I did need help getting into and out of bed on the first day. And I needed help like cleaning up my wounds a little bit and I'll get into that later too. But, and also she like just having someone there to make some food for you just to do basic things. Because after surgery, really you just need to rest. You need to sleep as much as you can. Hi, Minnie. You need to sleep as much as you can and you need to rest. So having someone there to help you make sure that everything else is running smoothly and to help take care of you is, I'd say it's necessary. Um, the hospital sent me a pack, a little like pre-surgical packet beforehand where it said, and it was funny because they specified in there, have a responsible adult stay with you for at least 24 hours after surgery. I recommend even 48, just because it is a huge help. So I think that's all for preparing yourself for surgery. Um, also wash your sheets and everything. Wash your sheets and everything. Um, just make sure that the clothes that you're gonna be wearing, she does that a lot, don't worry about her. Um, the clothes that you're going to be wearing, the place that you're going to be sleeping, make sure that the sheets are clean because, you know, when you're recovering from surgery and have been cut into, even though it's sutured and glued, you'll still want to keep everything as clean as possible just so you don't get any infections or anything like that. Um, there was the usual stuff. I couldn't eat after midnight, nothing to drink um, after like four hours before surgery. And there were a couple of other things. Oh, I couldn't take Motrin for the pre-surgical packet said for like five days before surgery, three to five days. My doctor during the pre-surgical appointment suggested that I don't take Motrin for about a week before surgery. I think Tylenol was the only thing I was allowed to have, which was helpful because I have neck and back issues in general. And so I was in pain and Tylenol helped a lot. But there's that. Um, but the day of surgery, so they brought me in, they gave me an IV, and it was interesting with this one because I've, like, they did a lidocaine shot before they actually put the IV in, so I didn't even feel the needle going in. It was really cool. Like, the lidocaine shot hurts, but it helped a lot, um, reducing the pain of getting the IV catheter in. 
and I've never had them do that before, so that was just a neat little thing that they did. Um, everyone was really sweet, everyone was nice. The anesthesiologist came up and talked to me for a few minutes. The pre-surgical nurse like, got the IV in and talked to me, and then the nurse who was going to be with me during surgery came and talked to me and asked me the same questions. And then the doctor came over, talked with me, asked if I wanted asked if I wanted her to take pictures of the procedure, which I said yes, because I have a medical background and that stuff is fascinating. Um, really, the only time I don't want to see pictures is when it's dental stuff. Um, but, yeah, they gave me IV fluids and then they brought me into the surgical room. I wasn't out yet. They had me scooch over from the initial like pre-surgical gurney bed over to the operating table um, and once I was in place they like strapped my arms to these like arm stands next to the bed and then they said that they would like maneuver my arms to my sides later once I was out of it to wherever they needed me to be and once I was in position on the bed so they didn't have to move me that's when they gave me the med the anesthesia um, they had told me that they were going to be doing IV anesthesia and then gas as well. And they did put an oxygen mask on me before I went out. Um, so I remembered that. And then I remember looking at the ceiling. And then I remember waking up. So surgery apparently went very smoothly. Um, my mom mentioned that it was really quick. Like they told her that the surgery was done and that I was waking up. And then they told her to go get the car and bring it around so I could just walk out to the car. And the doctor actually chased her down before she could even go get her car and said, hey, your daughter said that you'd be interested in seeing these and showed the pictures to her because she's a nurse. She also finds it fascinating. Um, but yeah, I went really quick once I woke up. And from the point I actually woke up and was talking to the post-surgical nurse, um, he gave me a bunch of instructions and a bunch of tips on what to do. And while we were talking, I woke up a little bit more. And then the doctor came over, made sure I was okay, told me everything went great. And then, like, within 15, 20 minutes, I was out of there. Like, I think I spoke with the nurse and the doctor for about two minutes. And then they brought my mom in, like, less than five minutes after I woke up. And then, like, less than 15 to 20 minutes after I woke up, I was discharged. And I was following my mom out, able to walk, out to the car. So the advice that the nurse gave me upon discharge was, first and foremost, Sprint. Like, because of the gas, so what the salpingectomy is, is they do a few incisions. Um, it seems like it's either one of two ways. It's either an incision at the belly button and then two incisions to the side and lower down, or it's an incision at the belly button and then two incisions on one side of the abdomen lower down. Um, for me, they did the belly button incision and then two lower on the right side of the abdomen. Um, and the reason why the doctor chose to do that was because she said it was less awkward to, like, maneuver on one side of the abdomen with the incisions rather than having to like reach around and maneuver with both on both sides. So that's why she did it that way. Um, but they inflate the abdomen with gas, CO2 I believe, so that they can see what's going on and see what they're doing and not nick any other nearby organs. And then they just go in and cut out the tubes, take them out through those two and through those few incisions and they stick a camera in there and that's how they're doing everything so they don't actually cut you open. It's just a few little incisions where they put in the camera and the instruments and then they just watch on a screen with what they're doing while they're working on it. And which makes recovery a whole lot better because if they like just cut into your abdomen with a long cut, it's probably a few weeks that you have recovery for with this, with a laparoscopy. It's not very long at all. As you can see, I'm up and moving around, and I'm active and everything, and it's only been five days now. Um, but they do that, so the nurse told me to drink Sprite, um, because what the gas does is there's something with one of the nerves 
I don't know the whole science with it, but something about the gas they use, like they remove as much gas as possible after the procedure, but there's still some gas in there and it needs to be absorbed into the body. And while it's being absorbed, um, something about it affects the shoulder. So it's definitely nerve pain that I was feeling up until like last night. Like today there's a bit of a twinge, but it's not much. Thankfully it's finally going away. Um, everything I'd seen online and what they had told me was you'll probably feel the shoulder nerve pain for like 48 to 72 hours. Mine went well into the 90 hour mark. And even today is still a little bit, but not nearly as much. Like I can barely feel it. It's like at this point, it's hard to tell whether it's actually the nerve pain or if it's just my regular shoulder issues going on. Um, but one of the ways to get rid of the gas is burping and flatulating it out. So what the Sprite does is it helps you burp. So you drink the Sprite and you like constantly are burping out that gas. So the more you burp out, the better it is for you. And the quicker that you'll get rid of the gas and thus the quicker you'll get rid of the pain. Um, so for the first few days, I noticed the pain like when I was sitting, like the only time it would stop was after I had laid down only on my back. Yeah, I had to lay on my back with my knees propped up by a pillow. And after about 10 minutes or so of resting, the pain would go away. Um, but within 10 minutes of getting up, the pain would come back. It was shooting up like the front of the shoulder. And then like when I would go to lay down, it would also go to like the diaphragm area, like right under the ribs. And some of it also radiated over to this side of the rib cage as well. Like I had to remind myself that it was just the gas and nothing serious. It was so painful, um, but I knew it was the gas, so it was fine. And it always went away after a while after laying down. But that was honestly the worst part of it was the gas pain with the shoulder. Um, there was also lip pain. So with the ET tube, the breathing tube, um, they had warned me right before surgery that the tubes, like they asked if I had any metal or anything. And when I mentioned fillings and crowns, they said, well, you know, sometimes the breathing tube can, you know, like break those or cause some issues with dental work. So we'll do our best to be careful. So what I think they did was end up using my lip as like a cushion so that to protect my teeth with the tube and my lip ended up being pushed against the bottom of my teeth and it dug into my lips so i had a few like gouges there and my lip was really raw and my lip was like this part of my lip was swollen when i woke up and stayed swollen for a few days that was also pretty painful but tolerable um yeah, shoulder pain was the worst, followed by the lip pain, and the last was the incision pain. Like, the incisions didn't really bother me at all as long as I wasn't touching them and as long as I moved carefully. Um, within an hour of getting home, I did end up pulling on one of the stitches and making it bleed a little. Um, my mom had just helped me lay down for the first time because I did need help getting up and back into bed because I was not able to use those muscles quite yet right after waking up from surgery. And a few seconds later, I realized that the pillow, um, like I needed the pillow to be brought down a bit more so my shoulders were on it. So I went to sit up just an inch or two, just like a minor crunch or crutch, whatever. Crunches? Yeah, a minor crunch just to move the pillow down. And as soon as I did that and laid back down, I felt a really sharp pain in one of the incisions. And I was like, oh crap, I should not have done that. Sure enough, I had my mom, I called my mom in to help me and she checked it out. And apparently like the incisions had been stitched and then they'd been glued. And I guess there were like little holes at the end of the incisions that hadn't been glued. And it was through those holes that like some like blood, bloody liquid was fizzing through. So she just had to wipe it down, add a bandage to it, and it was good to go. And I just made sure not to do that again for a few days. Um, but that was the only issue that I had with the incisions at all. Like they were glued down and the glue was kept. 
like they're still glued and they're healing up really well. Um, what else happened with the first day? Okay, so another thing I was warned about that thankfully didn't happen was the nurse told me that one of the potential side effects of the surgery was vaginal bleeding, even though it was just the tubes being manipulated and taken out. Apparently some people can end up having vaginal bleeding for like 24 hours. So when I woke up, I w they had put me in these like stretchy kind of cheesecloth like underwear and these really long pads, like long, huge pads that they put one of those in there and then they gave me some extras just in case it happened. Thankfully it did not. So I did not have any vaginal bleeding after surgery, but apparently some do. So heads up, if you're looking to get this surgery, that is one of the potential side effects. And I had also been warned about fatigue for a couple of weeks after the surgery, but I, as you can tell, I'm not fatigued. It's been five days and I'm like, my energy level is great. So I was really only like tired for a few days after. And then, so although I did need help getting into and out of bed for a little bit the first day, um, by the afternoon, because surgery was in the morning, I ended up being home by 10 a.m. Um, by the afternoon, I had figured out how to get out of bed on my own. I would like roll over to my side and then like swing my legs around and use my arms to like push me up and then get out. But I still needed help getting in bed. Um, but by the, by the nighttime, I think mostly I figured out how because I felt guilty about potentially having to call my mom in frequently to help me get up and get out of bed at night when she should be sleeping. Um, but I figured out how to get in and out of bed on my own by the end of the first night. And you will be getting in and out of bed a lot the first day. Like at least if they give you IV fluids like they did for me. Like, they went through an entire bag of IV fluids and pretty much every hour on the hour, I was getting up out of bed. Like I would never sleep for more than an hour and a half, which really annoyed me because I wanted to sleep, but I could only get little naps in here and there. And then I'd had to constantly get up to go to the bathroom and get back. Um, I could go to the bathroom just fine. Like I could walk and move around and sit down and like I could take care of myself just fine. It was just certain things I needed help with. Like I couldn't really bend or lean down very much and like certain movements with the core muscles was difficult, like getting into and out of bed until the end of the first day anyway. For pain meds, they gave me prescription Motrin, like the 600 milligram stuff. And then they also gave me hydrocodone with Tylenol. Uh, so I was able to alternate between those. The doctor suggested I take like Motrin at one point, and then three hours later, I could take a hydrocodone. Three hours later, Motrin. Three hours later, hydrocodone. Because um, you could take them each like about four to six hours per dose. So if I just alternated every three hours, it worked out fine. That was the other thing. Um, they suggested taking stool softeners or laxatives the first day because the anesthesia would make you constipated. And it did. Like, I have IBS, so I'm used to having diarrhea a lot. Like, my body is its own stool softener. Uh, but I did take a laxative once shortly after getting home, and then I took another one later the night, later the first night. I would highly recommend only doing one dose. That all you'll probably need because by the morning of the second day, I woke up at 5 a.m. in intense pain, like horrible trapped gas pain. I needed to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't. For like a good 45 minutes to an hour, I was constantly up and down trying to go to the bathroom, trying to get it out, and it wouldn't go. Um, so it did plug me up a little bit. Um, but and it was bad enough that while I was trying to get rid of that, you know, like plug, um, I had gotten really, really nauseous. Like I felt like I was going to throw up. I was feeling clammy and a little bit feverish and just so much pain. Like I think if it had been any other surgery on any other area of the body other than the abdomen, it would have been fine. But with 
the normal like constipation pain in addition to like the fresh incisions from the day before it was just a lot to deal with um but once the plug passed it was just like waves of diarrhea for another like two three hours and then through most of the day like after about half of the day by noon i think i had to take an anti-diarrheal pill um just to stop it because by then i had gotten everything out and it was just annoying at that point so that happened Oh, and while that was going on with trying to get the plug out, um, I needed my mom to help me again, getting into and out of bed because I was just so weak and I felt like I took a few steps back with recovery during those few hours. It was awful. So around the second day is when I realized that the icy hot patches helped out a ton with the shoulder pain. Um, but what I should have been doing instead was just using a heating pad, just throwing a heating pad on my shoulder. So I would recommend doing that if you end up getting this surgery and have that shoulder pain, just put a heating pad on. Like the icy hot patches help, like when you want to be up and around and moving, but for just sitting down and watching TV or something, just throw on a heating pad. It works faster, it works better. Like, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Use the heating pad, not just the icy hot patches. Um, but by, like, by, late morning, early afternoon, I was able to get out of bed again on my own, and I was recovering ju just fine from the morning's shenanigans. Although I was still having to lay on my back. Like, I think I tried laying on my side once or twice, but it was just way too uncomfortable. Like, the gas just moved and it hurt the incisions. So I just stayed sleeping on my back, legs propped up. It was annoying, but it was the only way I could sleep. And the second day was also when I was able to sleep for five hours, which was the longest I had been able to sleep since surgery. And I was also awake the longest for the first time that day for about five, six hours, too. Um, oh, and that was the other thing. I had frequent coughing for the first few days, I think because of the breathing tube. Like, it just felt like there was a bunch of mucus just caught in there, so I was frequently coughing. I um, never coughed anything up, just dry coughs, but thankfully it didn't seem to bother the incisions at all. Um, oh, and the first day they sent me home with a compression wrap. It's just, actually here I can show you. So yeah, they sent me home with this. It was just wrapped around my middle. Um, apparently there's some discourse, I guess, as to whether these things actually help or not um, with laparoscopies. But it seemed to help for me, at least for a few hours the first day. And then by the afternoon, it was just starting to get uncomfortable. So I ditched it after that and just had it on hand just in case I needed it again. But um, you can see on here, like where, there we go, like where I bled through. Like, I not only bled through the glue and the incision, but I bled through, like, this and the pants I was wearing at the time as well. So it did bleed through a lot when I stretched that stitch the first morning. Um, and this day, like, my lip was still swollen, um, but it had managed to scab up. Like, it wasn't raw. I couldn't see the actual gouges. It was just scabbed up with, the, like, these little white scabs. Still painful, though. All right, for the third day, it was actually the longest I stayed awake at over 12 hours. From like 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., I was awake. Like, I just wasn't tired enough to take a nap. Um, so I was not fatigued at all by the third day. And the third day um, was the hardest test. Um, I think the first day, my big test was to get in and out of bed on my own. The second day... I don't remember what my little test for myself and goal was the second day. But the third day, um, I had to take my mom back to the airport. And so I... Sorry, my cat's right here. Um, so in the morning, um, I had to tackle a flight of stairs outside my apartment and then tackle a drive to the airport. 
it's only about 20 minutes away from my home, so it wasn't that bad. Um, but it would definitely tell me like where I was at with recovery afterwards. So I was able to handle the drive just fine. Um, I could get in and out of the car just fine. Like driving, manipulating was totally okay. Um, I did have like the shoulder nerve pain and it also started triggering my actual shoulder issues from before too. Um, but that's just normal for me. And I was able to get my mom to the airport and get back home just fine. I stopped by a mini mart on the way, got some more Sprite because I'd run out. Yeah, so I handled it well, but the shoulder pain did increase a lot that day after the drive. Um, I found that, like, once I got back home, sitting on the couch and being heavily invested in Hell's Kitchen, uh, just sitting, like, slightly hunched helped a lot with the pain. Like, I was able to sit that way and not have shoulder pain. When before, I had been, like, with this couch, actually, like, leaning against the cushions to stabilize myself. And I think the act of leaning back caused more pain. If I had been leaning forward a bit more and hunched, I think there would have been less pain. So that might be something that you can try. If you're noticing in the first few days a lot of pain from leaning back to stabilize yourself against a couch or something, try sitting on the edge of the couch and just leaning forward a little bit, bracing yourself on your knees. Um, you might have a little less pain that way. It's worth a shot anyway. Yeah, also on the third day, um, the, one of the lip scabs started to come off, and then I still had a little bit of coughing, but not nearly as much as the couple of days before. Like, even now on the fifth day, I'm still coughing a little, but it's only like every hour or so, rather than every five to ten minutes. And the best advice at this point, like once the fatigue is gone, is just move slowly and listen to your body. Like if you start moving a certain way and it feels tense in the abdomen, like stop moving that way. Listen to what your body is telling you. Um, mostly so you don't pull a stitch or something, but just take it slowly. There's no rush. Um, work on improving, but don't overdo it. Just move slowly and carefully and listen to what your body is telling you as you're recovering. And so with the increased shoulder pain on day three, like it didn't really start improving until the end of the night, like right before I was going to bed was when it finally started going down. Like I was using the heating pad a lot the third day to try and keep down the pain. And this is also when the coughing started to get better as well. I think I already mentioned that. Um, I did a little experiment the third day because of the increased shoulder pain. Um, I thought maybe the Sprite was like causing more gas than I was expelling. So from about noon to late afternoon, early evening, I wasn't drinking any Sprite. And the pain was bad. It was really, really bad. So don't let up on the Sprite. Keep drinking the Sprite. It helps. It genuinely helps. Just make sure that you're burping it out. And then day four which was yesterday. Um, my initial plan was to go back to work on day four, at least for a half day for the afternoon, and then do a full day, day five at work. Um, but like my boss suggested actually that I take day four off and just do a half day at work, day five in the afternoon, just to get more rest. Um, I was a bit stubborn. I eventually gave into it and it ended up being a really good idea because I was pretty sleepy on day four. So yeah, when I woke up on day four, like my entire torso, including my shoulders and my neck and everything was just really stiff when I woke up. Like it took a lot of walking around and a lot of using the heating pad to like loosen it all up and not hurt as much. So I'm not sure what was going on there, but the heating pad and walking around helped a lot. Um, Genuinely, and the heating pad is going to be your best friend after this surgery. Um, I took another trip to 7-Eleven for Sprite, just a little mini test, just to see if I could handle another like minor trip outside to go run an errand and do something and get out of the house. I handled it fine. And then the drive to 7-Eleven on day four was easy 
as far as the incisions went. Like it didn't bother my incisions. It didn't bother my abdomen much. Like as long as you don't bump it against the steering wheel, you're fine. Um, but it was hard on my shoulder with the gas pain because that was still going on yesterday. Um, but by afternoon, evening, I was finally able to release enough of that gas to reduce the discomfort significantly. And I was able to like stay up for more than 10 minutes without the pain coming back. Like I think the pain stayed away for a few hours yesterday before it came back. And then um, I went to, I would go to sleep and take a nap and it would go away and I would be able to keep the pain at bay for much longer. Now oh, yeah, system returning to normal. Like after the second day when I was having the issues with trying to go to the bathroom, everything was fine after that. Like I think I had a bowel movement once on day three and then a few times on day four and a few times today. So it's gone back to normal by day four. And then on one of the incisions, I noticed that the edge of where the glue had been was starting to chip off a little bit, starting to come up. And then my lip was still hurting, like it hurt less, still scabbed, still a bit swollen, but the swelling had started to go down, finally. Yeah, so it looks like I was able to keep the pain at bay for over an hour, and that was the longest time I had gone without the shoulder pain. And that was around 9 a.m. that I, the pain came back and then I took a nap to get rid of it. And then late morning to afternoon, um, there was, yeah, so there was no pain from late morning, because I think I only took a nap for an hour and a half again, until mid-afternoon. And then when the pain came back, I took another nap. Um, but when I laid down for a nap at that point, it was just a dull pain. It wasn't like a really sharp pain, just a dull ache. Um, even with it moving around, like I could feel where the gas was moving around to, but it was just dull, it was tolerable. Like I think I still used the heating pad, but it wasn't bad, I was still able to go to sleep. Oh, and also last night was the first time I was able to sleep on my side. Um, it was actually comfortable to do so, the gas pain wasn't hurting me, and like throughout the naps yesterday, I think my body was just getting really sick and tired of sleeping on my back because my neck was starting to hurt. I couldn't find a comfortable way to lay my head down on the pillow and I just needed to be sleeping in a different position. And thankfully, because the doctor put all the incisions on the right side, I was able to sleep on my left side comfortably by the, fourth, by the end of the fourth day. And I was able to get a whole lot of sleep last night. I think from, when did I go to bed? I don't know when I finally went to bed. I think it was around 11 or midnight, um, but I slept up until like 10 a.m. this morning. Like there were a couple times where I got up to go to the bathroom or something or to grab a drink from the fridge, but I was able to get back to sleep pretty quickly afterwards, which is the most I've been able to sleep since before the surgery. So day end of day four to beginning of day five was when I was finally able to get my sleeping schedule back on track. And then day five today, um, I woke up at 10. It was fine. There was very, very minor shoulder pain when I was laying down, um, but the heating pad wasn't needed. I think this was from earlier this morning, like around eight or nine during one of the times that I woke up just for a few minutes. Um, there was minor pain, but not much, and I didn't even need the heating pad. Because um, the gas pain had severely decreased I was able to sleep on my side with no issue, and then it was the first day at work. So, um, I handled the drive to work just fine. I was able to go get myself a coffee, get there. Um, it did feel, I did feel a little bit weak when I got to work. Like, it just felt heavy carrying one drink and then my little, like, clutch purse with the wristband. Um, carrying both just seemed a bit heavy and was weighing me down a little bit, but I was able to get into work and be fine. Like I work a desk job and within a few minutes after getting into work, I walked around a little bit, talked to my coworkers, see how the week had been going. And then I was immediately thrown into a project a few minutes later. So I had something to focus on and I was rushing from the desk to the printer. Well, not rushing, like walking quickly. 
because I haven't tried to run yet, I'm not going to for a bit. I'm still going to take it easy and take things slow, because I know what my limits are right now, and I don't want to overdo it. Um, but I was walking fast to the printer and back to my desk just to get various things for this project. And, like, I worked from noon to five, and I had plenty of energy the entire time. I wasn't in pain. I went to the bathroom a few times. Um, the shoulder pain was gone. Like, I think there was a slight twinge of gas pain with the nerve, but it was hard to tell that it was there because it was so small. And like now, a few hours later, it's like seven o'clock now. Um, the pain's gone. It's completely gone. Thank goodness the gas pain is gone. Finally, at, by the end of the fifth day. Um, so I guess don't freak out too much if the gas pain, if the nerve pain lasts longer than they say it's going to. It sounds like it's different for everybody. Um, just drink coffee to get your system going, drink Sprite to burp it all out, just do what you need to do to get rid of the gas. Um, but yeah, so I'm doing far better than I expected to be. Um, I progressed a whole lot more than I expected to throughout this entire time. And like, thankfully I don't have kids. Like I just have a roommate and my mom is here to help and the cat is very lightweight. She doesn't, um, like when she does climb all over me, she was sleeping like on my legs um, for a lot of it. And thankfully she avoided the incisions, except once she tried to step on them. But for the most part, it was fine. So I'm, I could definitely imagine if you have kids already and you're getting the surgery done, the recovery will be a lot more difficult with kids running around and trying to get your attention and, um, like interrupting the healing process, but just do what you can. Hopefully you have some, a good support system with you. Um, I guess I would recommend if you have kids, find someone to babysit them like grandparents or something, just have them go for a few sleepovers for a couple of days, or make sure you have a supportive partner with you who can help you a lot with them because you need time to rest. Like you need to sleep, you need to rest, you cannot overwork yourself however much you may want to um, but that is my experience with the salpingectomy um, I have like a post-op appointment scheduled for two weeks after the date of the surgery so two weeks from just this Monday um, just to check up and see how I'm doing but I'm recovering great like I was really looking forward to getting this procedure done and I have no regrets about it, and I love it. And I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning of this or not, but I've already discussed this with my boyfriend as soon as I found out that this was even an option. Like, he's leaving it all up to me. This is what I've wanted. This is what I'm getting. This is what I did, what I got done. And our plan is adoption anyway in a few years. Like, we want to adopt a child. Like, locally. Probably. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, but if, for some unknown reason, we decide we want kids of our own, the ovaries are still there, the uterus is still there, I'm not going to go through pregnancy, so in vitro is not going to happen. I don't want to carry the pregnancy. If we have kids of our own, it'll be through surrogacy. And... Um, Yes, I know that adoption and surrogacy and in vitro and all of that is expensive, but guess what? So is having a kid naturally. Like, kids are expensive no matter what you do or no matter how you give them. They just are. Uh, and the biggest bit of advice that I have, if you want something like this done, like either a tubal ligation or a full-on salpingectomy to just get rid of the tubes altogether to make sure you can't get pregnant, um... Just keep asking doctors. Like, if one says no, go to another doctor. Eventually, you will find one who will say yes and who will do the procedure for you. You just have to keep on trying. Like, advocate for yourself. Because, unfortunately, we all know a lot of doctors won't. So, yeah, there's that. And also, let me see if I can just... Because Minna is being really cute right now. 
Okay. Yeah, so let me know if you have any questions or any comments for me. Whatever, let me just know if you want any more information. And it was great talking with you guys. I'll see you around next time. Normal videos will be coming fairly soon now that I'm back to my like let me stop. Now that I'm back to my like daily groove, I can start working on the AMVs again. So those will be uploaded soon enough, but I just wanted to get this video out of the way because I said I would do it and because there's not much information on the internet out there about salpingectomies. Like I've wanted to effectively sterilize or stay myself ever since I was 14 or 15 and I didn't even know this was an option until six months ago. So I'm sure there are plenty of other people who don't know that it's an option either and I want to get the information out there because we shouldn't have to fight this much to get like a procedure done that we want to get done for our bodies. So yeah, thank you and more videos will be coming.